Our next session is going to be one of the more important ones that we do today. And it has to do with where we draw the line on coach abuse. The line between tough love and emotional abuse in youth coaching has not always been clear. But lines are starting to be drawn thanks to U.S. Center for Safe Sports Standards, insurance provisions, and anti-bullying laws. There are other questions, though, that remain. Do we need a code of conduct starting in schools? If so, what goes in there? Who enforces it? And how do we adapt it by sport and by community? Hopefully, we're about to get some of those answers. Our moderator is Kent Babb. He's an author and an award-winning journalist at the Washington Post. And after our festivities are done today, you can meet him over at the reception where Kent will be signing copies of his new book, Across the River, Life, Death, and Football in an American City. Kent? Thanks very much. Everybody, welcome. Uh, thank you for attending. Uh, like you mentioned, uh, the book that I wrote was based, at, I, I embedded with the Edna Carr High School football team in 2019. Uh, these are kids <clears throat> from across the river from the French Quarter in New Orleans. Uh, and these are marginalized children who grow up surrounded by violent crime, uh, the drug trade, and tragically low expectations often. Football isn't just a game. Uh, it's a way to build confidence, structure. Uh, I witnessed things that made me very uncomfortable. Uh, sometimes it, it was uncomfortable as hell for me. But anyway, about, enough about that. I'm so excited to have this conversation because it extends so far beyond sports. The right way to coach is also the right way to lead a company or a department. It's the right way to parent children. Uh, it's, it's just it's management at the end of the day, and there's a right way to do it and a not right way to do it. Uh, and I think we stand at a crossroads moment right now for the right way to motivate, inspire, and get the best out of young athletes. But there is a line, and sometimes that line is fine. Uh, between getting players hyped and tough love uh, and verbal and psychological abuse. So I want to introduce uh, Jerese Colon, who's the CEO of the, United States, of the U.S. Center for Safe Sport, Tyree Burks, the CEO and founder of Players Health, and DeLon Parrish, a highly successful football coach who's led Wise High School uh, to four Maryland State Championships in the last six years. But who gets to, who gets to decide what that line is? Jerese? I'll start with you. Uh, where do you draw that line between tough love and what would qualify as abuse? You know, that's a great question. Um, sometimes it can be really blurry. Uh, when you think about, um, you know, how you've been coached throughout the years, how you've been taught, how you've been parented, sometimes it was necessary for some things to be a little bit tougher for you um, to make sure that things sunk in. Uh, I think back to when, um, I'm not, I'll tell you, I'm not an athlete. <laughs> um, I am a very slow uh, track runner. <laughs> um, and it, it didn't really matter how much, um, uh, you know, the coaches were trying to get me to run faster. It just didn't happen. I'm slow. I'm short. Um, but you were yelling at me wasn't going to make a difference, right? Threatening me wasn't going to make a difference. I was who I was and still today. And so I think when you think about coaching and when you think about making sure that your message is getting in, getting sinking into athletes, um, you have to do it very deliberately. You have to do it in a very trauma-informed way. Um, and you have to treat every athlete, every, every student differently because they're not all the same. They're not all coming from the same place. And I think sometimes we try to group kids into this bucket where they're just children, like you're 15 years old, you're 12 years old, and that's it. But there's so much complexity there that I think when coaches are trying to get them to run faster or to do better or to be more committed to something, that you can cross the line. And I think that when you're, when you're in that position of trust and authority, it's important that you take a step back and make sure that you're not pushing them too hard, also still trying to get to the, the end results. But understanding that you know this is not something, this is not 1970s, not to 1980s, not 2010. Um, the standards of care are different, and as coaches, um, as mentors, as teachers, we have to understand and recognize that. When I played football 20 years ago, we weren't allowed to get water, uh, and, and I was telling these guys earlier uh, that I still remember that's the thirstiest I've ever been in my whole life, traumatically thirsty. <laughs> um, 
Tyree, you played football at a high level. Um, I want to know what, what's your organization doing to educate coaches and to begin to plant this seed in their head that kind of what used to be okay, the not being able to get water, the screaming, grabbing face masks, things like that. Um, a lot of these coaches, they have these tried and true methods and tried and true isn't always right. Yeah, no, I, I couldn't agree with you more. I, I think with our organization, our company was founded on a mission to create the safest environment possible for an athlete to play the sport that they love. Everything in, about sports is really, it's emotional for me. Like I love sports so much because I grew up in a really, I grew up in the south side of Chicago. Had I not played sports, I'm not sitting on the stage. And, and so I feel like sports has given so much, has the potential to give so much to a kid. And the way that we view it in players' health is, I think about it in terms of the transaction between kids and sports. There are things that we want to deposit into our kids. Like when we, th when we think about parents, I want to give my kids motivation. I want to inspire them. I, 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 want to give, I want them to learn how to fail. I want them to have problem solving skills. Those are things that we want to give our kids. But what, what we also recognize is that within the relationship of a coach, that coach has the opportunity to now withdraw some of those things from the kid. You take motivation, confidence from a kid, depending on what that trauma is, that kid may not ever get that back. And it's going to affect them for the rest of their lives. And so I think when we think about how we support coaches to be better coaches, it's how do we make sure that the relationship is not a forceful relationship, but it's more of a powerful relationship. Like my coaches, like they were foundational in who I was. I was raised by a single mother. My coach was the, the, the most consistent male figure I had in my life that said, this is what showing up looks like. And I think it's really important that that relationship doesn't get tarnished with, with kind of our own emotional stuff that we deal with in coaching. It's so easy, I think, to forget sometimes or take for granted that the young people who are in your charge take every word and action you say seriously and literally, and they believe in you, and that's almost a blessing and a curse. Right. And uh, coach, I, I want to ask you next. You know, every day you coach a game that's centered on controlled chaos, and every day you face a room full of young eyeballs and vulnerable young minds. How is your approach changing? as you advance in your career and get older as a person? Well, for me, I think we all have to recognize words are powerful, right? What we say can hurt people, it can enhance people, and you have to stay vigilant and conscious of what you're saying. Um, times are changing, social media, um, people have access to practice and, and your locker rooms and what are you saying. Um, it's way different from when I first started when it's almost the community basically grab me and say, lead them, take them, do what you want, right? Now I have to be conscious of what I'm saying from the outside perspective looking in that they can grab certain words that I say and lose the context. So I've been able to put a coach responsible and I have a players committee, committee for us that if I say something wrong in practice, you know, they come to me at the end, and they, I allow them when I talk to them at the end of the day to raise their hand, and that means I have to go back and address something that I said that they could have took the wrong way. Um, also, I'm always allowing a coach now to manipulate <clears throat> what I say if he felt as though I was wrong. Um, and then we address those things, and that's all becoming part of the program, and that's how we've moved from the past where it was almost a wild, wild west, so to speak. And now I have to be more conscious of what I'm saying and how I'm saying it and make sure they understand there's no more do as I say, right? It's make them understand what you're trying to get across from. And I use my grandmother's old context. If I have to think about what I just said was wrong, it's probably wrong. Yeah, because I said so uh, is not a very uh, effective form of parenting. I, my little girl is four years old and I learned that pretty quick because I said so doesn't work. Uh, I want to follow up really quick about your, your committee because it's, it's counterintuitive in the traditional culture of sports because you're supposed to say coach is the boss. Coach knows all. I, you know, I, I'm going to do whatever he says, whatever he says is right. So I would think that's hard to have a young athlete be on your same level but it's also necessary. So what's an example of having your committee and, and a young athlete said something that was uncomfortable but was also right? 
Well, for me, being in education, I understand that I'm not always right. Right, I have to be, become, I have to evolve in things that I do on a daily basis, um, academic, socially, right, um, athletically. So it's not a bad thing. One of, the, one of the reasons why we're so effective is because I care so much and I let the young men know I'm not always right. Sometimes you need to bail me out. We have that trust, right? So I trust that leadership committee that if I said something wrong, come to me, right? Point it out. This is another form of problem solving. This is making you a better adult. It's making you a better person. So I, I encourage that, right? And I'm not always gonna be right. I understand that. I recognize it. My word is law when it comes to the discipline of what we're doing, not the context of how I may say something that could affect somebody's feeling. Teresa, I wanna come to you on, on an offshoot of that topic because I love that. I love what he says and I love the, the idea, the concept of even having kind of a, a moment or a committee where everybody is equal and you know, pointed out, a, you know, everybody should be better at minding their own blind spots. That said, in some sports, football obviously, baseball, a lot of sports probably, um, a lot of teams and coaches are not there yet. Uh, so I wanna know what is the right way uh, there's a, sports also has like this antiquated code of silence and family yeah. business and we keep all this in house. Um, if say I'm an, a young ambitious co assistant coach and I'm witness witnessing something uncomfortable uh, from my boss, my head coach, what, what can I do, what can I say without jeopardizing my career? <laughs> you know, that's what we deal with at the Center for State Sport almost every day. Um, you know, we've built this culture of silence over decades, right, where it is not cool to, to rat on people or to get in people's business. And that goes beyond sport, right? It goes in just business and just everyday activities. And so one of the things that we did first and foremost was, you know, try to create a space that was safe for people to come forward. Um, sometimes that means not telling you, telling us who you are, right? Because you do have a fear of retribution. Um, it's also knowing and trusting that once you make a report or once you see something that isn't quite right, that the person you're calling, the group you're calling, is actually going to take action. Um, and if something happens afterwards where you, you are retaliated against, that that action is also going to be taken a look at too. And that's what we do each and every day. Um, and when you think about, you know, well, you don't want to get to that place, right? You want to be able to stop these things before they even start. And so when you look at local organizations and local sports teams, it's about building that in at, at the beginning um, and making sure that everyone who is involved um, at every level, whether it is a, uh, an athlete, an assistant coach, an owner, like whoever it might be, um, a parent, um, you know, that they know that one, there are things that will not be tolerated, first of all, and that if they do happen to occur, that there is going to be real action and accountability that is levied against these people um, because no one should have to suffer through that. Um, and for have someone who has the courage to step up and say, look, this isn't right, like that should be recognized and those people shouldn't be penalized for that. And that's how we start to change culture, not only in sport, but just culture in, in, the, in the world in which we live. Yeah, I feel like so much of it is just kind of having that idea, that thought in your mind of here's the barrier, you know, here's, I, I'm aware that this is something that is present and being mindful of your words and actions. Now, it's easy as we sit here, like you're not in the heat of battle. This is not a time of duress. Um, and that's, that's the challenge, but at least it's still there. So Tyree, uh, next I want to come to you. I mean, it is a slippery slope when you're under stress, under duress. And given the culture of some sports, particularly in some re regions of the country, like my beloved but complex South, um, there's no realistic catch-all for everybody. I mean, every team is built up of a cluster of individuals with different personalities, different, they respond to different incentives and stimuli. Um, so how can we do a better job of convincing coaches that just being thoughtful and compassionate is more than a talking point? Yeah. It's, it's not just something they have to check off the list during a training. How do we actually get them to embrace that this is valuable and makes them a better coach? Yeah. It, it comes down to performance. I think I'm really inspired by Coach Paris because everything he just described in terms of the processes that he put in place to create a safe environment, like 
he's going to get the very best out of his kids. I don't even have to see it. I, there's, no re, there's, no, like, there's no doubt in my mind that he's successful because he's being intentional about that. And it's really giving coaches the tools to understand that here are the most successful coaches out here, like Coach Paris, that are doing these things. That, and they're getting the most out of their kids because they're being intentional about it. And, and we're, as a coach, we're competitive. We want, we, we want to be successful both on and off the field. But as a coach, we also we have to realize why we're doing what we're doing. My reason for being a coach is not because I want to win. Is I, I want to inspire kids, and I want to make sure that I create another version of who I am, where kids that may not know who they are, I can help them explore and, and become who they are. And I think if coaches really understand that they're going to get the most out of their kids, not both on the field or court or ice that they're doing, but also in the classroom and everything is really the main objective is to grow people and helping them get a better understanding around the impact of what that looks like is going to help motivate them differently. I have maybe the best job in the world. I'm very uh, aware of that and uh, as, as well as its um, ridiculousness sometime, but I've covered uh, sports at the professional college and high school level and high school is my favorite because that's that's the one level where you can really change lives you can also go too far you know you can change them for the worse so uh, it's, it's 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 there's a, it's an art form it, to to take these vulnerable people uh, who've come to you and not do too much or not do enough uh, so coach uh, I keep putting you on the spot for these specific memories um, but so many kids see sports as, as their way out. And I think that's overdone to a degree. A lot of young people don't understand there are many, many, many ways out. It's partly about awareness. That's a different panel. Um, but it's also a big part of their identity. So when you were playing the game, what's something that you experienced that you told yourself, man, if I ever become a coach, I will never do that? Respect. <clears throat> I always want my players to respect me and have respect for them. Um, I've worked in some environments that was very disrespectful, even as an assistant coach. So I was thinking about that when he was asking that question. Um, so now I try to talk to people as if their partner is standing next to them, right? I want to maintain that respect. And let's, let's be honest, I'm definitely not perfect. And I had to get to this level to create. I've been in situations that I had to rethink some of the things that I did, right? I've had former players come to me and, and talk to me about some things that they may have took the wrong way, but they're coaches now. Um, fortunately for me, they took the majority of the positivity that I was spreading, right, and didn't allow some of the negative things that I said um, to affect them, and they still wanted to become coaches and told me how much that affected them, but it hurt to the hear that one thing they took that I said, right? And um, I never forgot that. So I am happy that I was able to maintain still the respect level, but unfortunately they had so much respect for me back then, they couldn't come to me and talk to me. That's why I had to create that committee, right? A group of young men um, to come up to me and, and challenge that, right? Do not be afraid. Come to me at any time. Always be ready, prepared to check me when it comes to a level of respect. So it's been hard, but I'm growing, and it I'm going to continue to grow. I think it makes the job harder as a coach, but it's the right thing to do. I mean, it's like being a good parent to do it the right way and to be thoughtful and a human is it, it's harder than, you know, using a belt or, or yelling. I mean, that's the way my parents did it, and <laughs> I don't think that's the right way now. Um, Dries, I feel like we're at a very interesting time in our society, uh, sports culture included. Um, we seem to be at the beginning of this movement that sees athletes recognizing their worth and their power, and that's across all levels. Uh, on the flip side, a lot of coaches feel threatened by this, and they might call certain athletes soft or uh, say players are too entitled. Um, where's the bridge? Well, I think it's about understanding priorities, right? I mean, I think what we've seen play out, and you know, we, we're really close to the Olympics, and you know, we saw a number of athletes come out during both games that were like, look, I need to take time and space for me and my mental health, 
it doesn't mean that I am soft. It doesn't mean that I am not at the top of my game. It means that I am prioritizing myself you know, throughout this entire process. In order to do that, we have to think about, particularly mental health, it's just health, right? If I was, if I had injured myself and I had a broken leg or a broken ankle, you wouldn't push me, right? You wouldn't call me soft then, you would try to help me get better, right? It's the same thing with mental health. Like you really have to recognize that it is a, it's a priority, one, it fuels everything that we do, um, and that it is something that as a nation, we're finally starting to recognize as it being important it's okay to go to therapy. Like I can remember like decades ago, like people didn't talk about it because it was so taboo. Now it's just common. And so I think that, you know, as people really start to embrace this whole notion of taking care of your, your, wellness, your well-being and your mental health and in making wellness a priority among everything, that that will start to change. And we're starting to see that already because people are being vocal about it. It won't happen if, if we didn't have these athletes coming out and saying enough is enough, right? They should be commended for that because they are really fueling this movement. It, it's extremely brave and, you know, I know from my own journey like this, it actually makes you a better person, a better leader, a better athlete, you know, certainly a better coach uh, if you can sort of decompress some of those thoughts. Um, but we kind of remain at uh, a little bit of a frontier on this. I, th I think we're just at the beginning of it. Um, similar to Coach Parrish's uh, committee, uh, in New Orleans, Edna Carr has a small leadership group called Pride Panel. Uh, it's a safe space with only one rule. There's no lying. Uh, tell us what you're thinking and experience. Give us the real, they say. Tyree, this struck me as uncomfortable as hell. Yeah. You know, just like sort of seeing this, this truth laid bare. Um, so last question uh, for you guys. Uh, wh what does Players Health recommend doing as far as putting athletes and coaches on similar levels like what Coach is talking about, even if it's for a short time? I think we need to create a, a framework that allows those, that allows those, relate, those conversations to happen. I think when we talk about how do you create space, safe uh, spaces for people to be who they are, they have to feel comfortable with telling the truth. Um, and, I, and, I, and it goes back to some of the things that we're doing specifically around coach development on what it means to create a powerful relationship for you as a coach to your kids. We have a bunch of training that we do specifically around abuse prevention, but also what is a good culture in sport really looks like? And that has to change culturally across the board. And so I, I always talk about how do, as a coach, how do I make sure that I receive and give feedback well? How do we make sure that our kids know how to receive and give feedback well? And making sure that when they do communicate something, that bothers them, that, they're not, that, they, that there's, there's not repercussions for that, that it's something that's actually being listened to and acted on. Because that's gonna give them the opportunities or, or, or make them feel more comfortable to actually know that they can do that and be, be more open. But that takes time, it, it, it takes trust right. to start to build those relationships so the kids know that they can actually say, hey, this, this, this bothered me. And the coach goes, all right, I didn't know that that, did, that, that that affected you this way. This is how I'm going to respond differently. That, that, that's, that, 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 there's a whole process that has to happen across kind of the evolution of sports for us to make that happen in, uh, kind of at scale. Well, I, I love it. And, Coach, uh, if you need a middle-aged, overweight linebacker this year, <laughs> I, I want to play for you. Um, well, we want to open it up for a handful of Q&As. We've got about five minutes left. Um, so if anybody wants to submit a question, uh, for the the esteemed panel here, we'd we'd love to love to have them. All right, here's our first one. What are realistic ways for coaching conduct policies to be enforced by schools and community sports providers? Um, how about coach? Let me let me hear from you first on this one. <laughs> realistic, like that's the that's the I think the operative word here. What are realistic ways? I've been thinking about this a lot. Um, I believe. <clears throat> The coach should be judged by his community. The players involved, other coaches in that community, and then the parents, right? They know what their community want to happen, right, for them. I, I, it's not one separate way to, I don't believe coaches like it's not one way to raise a child, right? In my house, I can yell at one child and they calm down. One, I might tap one a the butt, they calm down. One, I can just look at. It's all different. Your community knows what you want, right, or what the, you're trying to convey. So I think they should be the judge and jury. So for me, I have no problem. I, I once was in a situation, I said, point blank, if my team want me gone, I'm gone. If the parents want me gone, how can you coach anyway effectively if you've lost the trust of your players and your family? So for me, that's easy. 
the players, right, the coaches, the parents in that community. That, those should be the people that's on that committee to get rid of you or decide whether your fate is. Looks like we have uh, time for one or two more. Um, how do you address abusive coaching from opponents at games? Do you address it afterward? How do you even start that conversation? Um, Terry, I think I'm going to direct this one to you, sir. That's actually, we were actually talking about that um, in the green room, kind of getting ready in terms of just one of the things that we're seeing right now in terms of opponents in the crowd. Like, how do you respond when there's inappropriate or racial heckling happening at our organization? And there has to be a zero tolerance policy. And I think Jerry said it best in terms of like, what are we not gonna tolerate? Let's make sure that that's very clear and how are we gonna respond? But actually, we have, to, we have to operate, adversity is gonna happen and we need to think about the worst ahead of time and actually have a plan for it. I know we don't like to do that in youth sports, but because of what we operate, how society is today, we actually have to think about the worst case scenario for that situation and actually put together a game plan around it. And I think it, well, you're not gonna get it right the first time, but as you continue to respond, the, the proper way, you'll know exactly how you can do that and then we can, you now have a case study around how you can share that with other organizations. Um, but it has to be a zero tolerance policy. Say the crowd is heckling an organization. There has to be a threat to stop the game and actually empty the stands. Like to go to the length that lets everyone know that this won't be tolerated is where we have to go. And then it actually makes everyone think differently around how they're gonna, uh, how they're gonna behave. All right, great questions, whoever you are. Uh, I wanna thank uh, the panel here, wonderful answers, and I'm learning from you. I'm stealing this wisdom and applying it to my own life uh, and player on Madden. So uh, thank you guys so much, I appreciate it, uh, and I've, I've learned quite a bit. So thank you for being here. Thank you. Thank you.